A very warm welcome to everyone joining us today for this Education Without Borders Roundtable. My name is Ben Finkel. I'm the Regional Vice President for Leeds Square in Oceania and your moderator for today. We have a wonderful panel of speakers, industry and government leaders who will dig into what we can do as a community to promote and drive quality education across regions. We will look at partnerships that exist and new partnerships that can be forged between government, education and technology providers. We will explore technology collaboration for scale and examine the culture of innovation motivating the growth of education across borders. Some quick housekeeping before I introduce our panellists and open the roundtable for discussion. For those new to Livestorm, to your bottom right is the chat box where we encourage you to send through your questions. We will endeavour to keep some time at the top of the hour to share those with the panellists and uh, hopefully uh, invoke some more discussion. So with us today, we have Honourable Lisa Singh, CEO of Australia India Institute and Deputy Chair of the Australian India Council. Lisa is a former Senator and first woman of South Asian heritage to be elected to the Australian Parliament. Lisa brings years of experience in promoting Australia-India relations at a business, diaspora and academic levels. Michelle Wade is the Commissioner, South, East State, South, South Asia State Government, Victoria, a highly experienced international trade diplomat. Michelle manages government trade and investments across South Asia, closely working to improve international students' experience. Ravni Power is the Vice President, Global Alliances, and CEO of South Asia for Deakin University. Ravni has 28 years of experience in the international education sector forging partnerships and global alliances for Deakin University in South Asia. And then we have David Linky, the Managing Director at EduGrowth, Australia's EdTech and Education Innovation Industry Hub. With over 15 years experience in K-12 education in Australia, Asia Pac, the UK and the US, David mentors, facilitates, leads and advocates for the EdTech community. David, I'd like to start with you, please. Uh, for us at Leeds Squared Australia, we experienced tremendous momentum with help from EduGrowth and Invest Victoria. What are some of the associations, bodies, or partnerships that organisations should be aware of and seek help from as they plan to go international? Thanks very much, uh, Ben, and thank you to everyone that's been here and uh, Lead Squared for inviting me and my co-panelists. So I'm really looking forward to, to today's conversation. And I, I think it's a really interesting question to think about the connection between Australia and such an incredibly large um, economy like India, and especially one that's emerging so quickly as a, a, a really sort of sleeping giant and uh, very soon to become not so sleeping and to become the sort of the giant across the EdTech community across the world. And I, I echo your comment before around the support that you can get from government agencies, especially those at national and state government level. So obviously Global Victoria is one of those entities that has a fantastic network of education services managers across the world and, and especially uh, between these two markets. Uh, partnering with their friends at Investment in Victoria, trying to really help build those economic connections between Victoria and India and doing such an incredible job. And um, we've, we've, one of the, the challenges we have in the indus in, um, industry is making sure that government hear the voice and actually action it. And that's certainly the case with those two entities. We, we've done quite a lot of work with them and in partnership with the Australia India Institute as well in trying to understand what are the big opportunities and how we actually connect them. So um, for, for some summary, I definitely think Global Victoria Investment Victoria, there's some uh, Indian based entities that I think are really valuable for you. And I think the India Didactic Association, if you are thinking about education across borders in this market, um, obviously IDA based out of um, Delhi and they have a big conference in Bangalore, are incredibly well connected and a fantastic place to go and start doing some business. We, we then have obviously the Australia India Institute, which have a deep understanding of the cultural connections that we can create for them. And, and they would be remiss without um, referring to Austria as well, which has a, uh, an Australian voice that they can help. So I'm, I'm biased towards EduGrowth, obviously. I lead EduGrowth, but uh, I think people with deep experience like IDA, Edu, um, EduGrowth, Global Vic, InvestVic, and um, Australia India Institute can really help in those, building those partnerships. Thank, thank you, David, because 
Go on, Lisa. Can I add a couple of things, Ben? Uh, because uh, firstly, I just want you to all know from um, Victorian government's perspective, our role, if you like, is to anticipate um, market trends and look at where we have capability. And because Victoria is already known as a, as a global education leader, probably back in 2019, uh, we started to take a look at this. And, and the good news is we collaborated with uh, Australia India Institute, who then went and did deep research, but used you know everyone on this panel actually to help us build a pathway. Then we had COVID come in between. But what David said, I wanted to add the point that um, with the India Didactic Association and, and their event Didac in September, uh, we'll actually be hosting an outbound mission for Victorian companies in the ed tech sector. So if you're interested and, and you're a Victorian company, let me know. If you're an Indian company that wants to meet the Victorian companies, um, let us know as well. Ben, can I just can I thank both Michelle and David just for acknowledging the role the Institute has played um, uh, over the years, particularly in relation to answering this particular question, but on on the research side. I think when we look at this question, though, you know, the Institute has been supporting ed tech startups as well connect to, to the Indian, with the Indian market through some of our research reports, looking at where the opportunities are, hosting roundtables and the like. Um, and I, I agree, I think, um, you know, with Lead Squared that edgy growth can provide excellent advice to newcomers to the market in Australia and India. Uh, and indeed other other international markets. But I just wanted to, to sort of go a step back and say sort of prior to sort of looking at identifying partners, I think a really important first step would be to have a clear idea about the purpose of education providers of education organisations. You know, something like in excess of 10,000 private providers of education in India you know, many of which work in the ed tech space. So before identifying organisations that might help their cause, I think we need to have a really clear idea of what their contribution is going to be. Um, and I think articulating that contribution will help identify what partners and what associations might help them achieve their aims. Yeah. Thank you. If I can just come in as well. Thanks, everyone. It's great to be here. And uh, thanks to Lead Square to actually organize this. Um, I think it, from my perspective, um, you know, I totally agree with what Lisa, Michelle and David have said that uh, it is going to be an important aspect to see why and what. Uh, but I can just tell you from our experience that um, EdTech is going to be the space that is going to be used definitely in developing countries such as India. Uh, for um, upskilling more so than just focusing on the university degrees or um, certification. So I think that uh, think of EdTech not just from a university perspective, but uh, from a perspective of enhancing the value that you can bring to countries for upskilling um, and use of uh, you know, short term programs as well, which I think a lot of the EdTech companies have been doing very successfully. Yeah, because I think the theme overall that we're all trying to support is lifelong learning. And there are, from an institutional perspective, from a ground, grassroots level, and then obviously the technologies that wrap around that. But that intersection where institutions and the technologies actually uh, talk and uh, group together to, to collaborate, how, how do you go about that? And how, if you have a voice in one of those sectors, um, be able to uh, reach out and uh, be part of that outside of maybe just the, the formal, um, you know, events that are in the calendar. I'll, I'll anyone... jump in there and I'll, I'll jump in there and and and, add the, uh, and make the point that I think it's around the partnership, right? Like it's about building connections between education providers, um, as Revneet said, regardless of whether they're higher ed or universities, they can be across that whole lifelong learning continuum. And I think that you'll see those partnerships that can emerge and be really quite structured. They can be simple things like voice of customer, because it's basically about understanding what each partner is looking for in that. You can start to move into things like piloting and you start building new business models together and testing them in market to ease the entry point. 
you can move into formal pilot programs and you can bring along researchers into that conversation as well. And one of the things that's really important to remind ourselves is that whilst Redlink makes the point that it's not just necessarily higher ed, I would agree with that, but there has been decades of investment by institutions like Deakin and many others into these markets that have built brands that are incredibly strong and they're fantastic partnership models. And we talked about it a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, in our preparation for today. And I, I do point out that, remember, it's not a one-way street, right? Like it's not about Australian or, or Victorian ed tech companies or providers basically going to support the development of an boutique economy like India or an emerging economy like India. It can actually be the other way. And there's an a, a absolute plethora of, uh, ed tech companies from India who are making inroads across the whole of Asia Pacific and into Australia as well. And they are doing some things that um, somewhere in me, I'm frustrated that we're not doing more of it out of Australia as well, but there are some incredibly exciting opportunities. Yeah. And, and uh, David, just picking up on your point on that, I think that uh, it is really important to identify the sweet spot, you know, like what is it that the market wants? Um, and with India, the question, of course, is the pricing strategy as well as the scalability strategy. And then you're talking about quality control, accreditations, and things like that. So it does become a little complex, but it is doable. Uh, you know, like our example is we were the first Australian university a couple of years ago, and this is pre-pandemic, to actually have a very strong partnership with a large tech company in India. Uh, when they were really talking about this with Australia and we ventured into that, uh, you know, with the idea that it is a pilot for us and we want to see where we go with this. Of course, we'll have challenges within our own system because accreditation is important, but also there will be challenges in understanding the market. And I have to say on reflection, it has been a great experience and a very successful one. So then one starts to think that if you don't, don't take the risk at the right time, you know, you are not necessarily going the path that you need to be going into the future. Exactly what David is saying. We need to be doing more of that from the Australian context as well. One of the um, things I wanted to mention about partnership and collaboration, and it goes, you know, if you like, it's that journey of um, where you hit scalability is um, the part of partnerships I want to talk about. We've got a couple of examples from Victoria, um, E2 Language, which does English language coaching for IELTS, and um, Tali Health, which is for children with um, special needs. They've partnered E2 with Pearson, Tali Health with Times Group. I'm looking at who those emerging partners might, might be going forward um, for companies that have a proven product and are ready to scale up. I'm really quite fascinated right now, and I'm sure that anyone in India can relate, that every time you turn around right now, you tend to get a Tata point on the new new program, whether you're buying from Big Basket or buying an airline ticket. And that's quite a, a specific audience for the sorts of um, the, the sorts of pricing that some of the Australian providers might have. I'd be looking, keeping a really close eye on those big corporates who have fidelity programs, where that's going to take us, what sort of bonus offers they might be offering. So, so Tata was one. And then, of course, it led me down the path of taking a look at Reliance. Go, well, Reliance has a big gaming platform. Where's that going? And sure enough, they're already moving into the ed tech space. So that's some of those market trends to keep an eye on, on where partners might be coming and where ed tech promotion might be emerging from in the future too. Ben, Lisa, your question, you're yeah, just picking up on, you were just talking a little bit also about um, just picking up on what um, Ravnik was saying about quality and, and price point, sweet spot as, as we want to call it. Um, you were talking about though in the, in the context of lifelong learning. Um, you know, I think this is really interesting on the, particularly when you were looking at India because, you know, India has, has now built lifelong learning into its national education policy. So, and, and not only that, it's obviously linked to the SDGs. It's like linked to SDG 4, uh, ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. So I think this is, this is another sweet spot that has, has got a lot of area for growth between 
both of our countries. And one way we've seen technology and lifelong learning pull together uh, productively is in micro-credentials. Mm. You know, they, these have become increasingly popular across the globe, actually, over the last few years. But many of those micro-credential courses are delivered remotely through the use of digital technology. It makes it very easy for people who have responsibilities such, you know, balancing work and family commitments to update their learning and get new skills. So I think there's a lot more scope for people who, you know, might have finished a degree years ago or who never studied after secondary school to benefit from how institutions and technology are now working together. And I think that's also incredibly important, looking at changes in the economy and the impact of COVID-19, the changing nature of work, all of that, I think, gives lots of sort of potential sweet spots, I would say, between both of our countries in looking at future sort of growth areas. And it feels like... Can I just... I, I don't, sorry, sorry, Ben. I was just going to say, I, I think that when we think about long, lifelong learning, if we stop for a moment and think about the key trends that we're seeing across education, micro-credentials, boot camps, workshops, all of these things... Um, and as, as um, was pointed out before, I've known some of these panellists for a very long time and I can't imagine sitting in a um, five-star hotel for three days being taught corporate training as, you know, I know, corporate communications. I can't imagine that that's a model that will continue to be evolved. And it, there's no doubt that when we think about these components and especially lifelong learning, um, there's absolutely no doubt that technology is going to be a key enabler it might be the driver of it. I don't think it's going to be the, the sole delivery point. It's going to be an enabler of some of these models that we're seeing. And I, I think that you're starting to already see chief people officer and chief learning officers across corporate 500s and Fortune 500s who are going, you know what, we need to rethink how we give training on demand at the point of need when that employee needs it. And especially in really incredibly tight labour markets, right? Like if you've got incredibly candidate-driven markets, instead of... Um, trying to find a new employee. How about we try and keep an employee and upskill them and retrain them? And uh, there's no doubt that that's certainly a model that you see across all parts of um, Asia Pacific, but especially in India as well. And, and I think that uh, the other point that I'd like to make, like, look what's happening in India. You know, for example, I could easily say that um, pre-COVID, um, you know, when you say talk about online learning, there was some sense of uncomfortableness amongst the corporate. But I think post COVID or in, in three years into COVID, I think we've had a great sense of acceptance of what a hybrid model using it tech could look like. So I guess the market potentials when you talk lifelong learning is definitely around the whole student body because the students are looking at flexibility, they're looking at doing different things at different times. So you have that whole pool of the student body, perhaps more towards the postgraduate side. Um, then you've got the whole pool of people into the workforce, you know, five, seven years of sort of getting into the workforce. That's a, it's a big pool, the middle management as we call it. And then you talk about large companies with international operations trying to bring their learning and development onto the use of technology. And that's where I think that the edtech platforms play a very important role. Whether you talk about micro-credentials or you talk about full degrees, I think the whole scope is quite quite um, interesting. Um, you know, edtech in India has seen more than 4,000 startups. So, um, you know, you can tell that this is a huge line of business. And what I would encourage Australian companies and Australian ed tech companies to think about a collaborative model with India because India has the market potential, as you may say, the scope of the market potential given its size and population and the need for education. You know, you don't get a job in, in India if you are not a postgraduate. If you don't have a master's degree, you don't get a job in India. You know, that's the that's the real fact. So people are wanting to continue to uh, see where they go into the education journey and lifelong journey becomes even more important. So I think that's one point I want to make. There is a huge potential for collaboration, whether it is around digital technologies, whether it is around micro-credentialing, whether it is around bringing technology into curriculum and education and working with edtech partners in India. So I think that will be a great potential for people from Australia. I mean, for example, Baiju's, 
uh, it's a unicorn and valued at about $1 billion. Um, you know, a huge success story from where to where. So there's lots that one can learn. And so this, this future of this happy medium of classroom or office and, and online, the communication of that and the adoption of that is the responsibility of, of many. Uh, so from the school, so from a K-12 perspective, um, you know, introducing the technology to, to young learners um, through the higher ed and uh, then corporate, um, how do we um, involve, you know, the parents and, and the other groups who are on the fringe now and, and enable them to actually be part of that um, driven DNA for lifelong learning and also participate in that? I think the communication plan from, from the institutions and the corporate um, should be consistent. Um, how are you seeing that aspect um, in the marketplace? I think it's a question of connecting the various stakeholders, you know, into the into the whole journey. So whether from a student's perspective, it is the student and the institution who has to think about the importance of this and the acceptance of this, then the, the parents. For example, you know, if somebody wanted to do a deacon micro credential or a deacon um, sort of a undergrad degree, and if we were offering it online on an edtech platform. They didn't have to travel all the way to Australia if it was just about the degree. Um, and if that's or they could start here and then eventually come in. So I guess it saves money. Um, it can save um, you know, the ability to be able to be in your home country. It can give you more connectivity and you are able to experience uh, you know, use of technology into education. So I think that it is really about bringing in the value to various stakeholders and defining what that value is. Can I, yeah. I, I think the question was, um, Ben, about parental engagement, right? Um, and and about how do we incorporate them and, and connect them all into it. Um, I'll make the, the statement and uh, the reality is I think parents play a really big role in student choice, right? Like, um, as certainly in Australia, as an example, students are getting, um, um, oh, sorry, young people are getting older and older before they leave home. So parents make big um, influence on where they go as far as pathways are concerned. And my experience in India is that um, um, mums and dads are pretty, pretty important in what uh, what the children in their households decide to do. So I think that the parents are certainly involved in, in, in those education decisions. And the reality is technology is en enabling them to see into the classroom a little bit, to see what they're learning and how it's connected to the workforce. You're starting to see organisations, and in fact, Deacon Co is a great example of it, where they're starting to map skills across uh, degrees through micro-credentials into workforce and being able to translate them back so that people get an understanding of skills, maybe skills gaps and skills opportunities. So I, I'm really bullish on this idea that uh, an integration across education providers, whether they're formal and credit, like a university or a school or a, or a vocational provider, or they could be private providers. There's, an, there's an, a plethora of private providers arriving. And I go back and think a little bit about um, corporate strategy and I think about competitive advantage and one of the things that's I think an Australian competitive advantage especially in markets across Southeast Asia and, uh, and India is a great example is the Australian qualifications framework right <laughs> it's, it's well regarded it's globally recognized all of our degrees and programs are connected to that we're now starting to see the federal government and state government support to build um, micro-credentials into these AQFs. So th there's a great pathway there from a standalone course into a much bigger opportunity. And, and as Ravaneet said, that you might have delivery models changing where you're beginning in um, a, a local city in uh, India and you might then be doing a boot camp of 12 weeks here or finishing off a postgraduate here. So you're seeing all of these new models emerging. But I'm going to go on a limb and say I think India is still going to be driven by the credential. Somebody mentioned that you need a postgraduate degree to get a employment. That may change, but I think it feels like in Australia we're still a couple of generations from it completely changing, and India may be even longer because this is embedded desire to have the right university certificate, and um, I think these are really important things. One of the things um, I wanted to mention on this topic around quality as well is that, you know, after an explosion of those, you know, 4,000 startups we've seen in India, as well as the many international companies 
um, looking to enter this market, but you know, let's take it as a global trend. I think the real challenge um, for for uh, providers is that they're going to be working increasingly with a more discerning audience. So it's my view that over the next few years, you're going to see the cream float to the top. Um, an example I'd say at sort of the K to 12 level is um, I was recently brought into a meeting and, and I looked at uh, an Indian company's tech, and uh, it was a, it was a beautiful bit of um, kit, if you like. It was a it was a nice bit of education kit. But I was questioning the value back to pedagogy on it, sort of saying, actually, this is this is edutainment. It's not education. And uh, making sure, I think, as providers that you can really um, articulate your outcomes, I think, will be something to look at going forward. Lisa, I think when we spoke about this in preparation, you know, you also highlighted that there's some considerations for Australian universities that are outside um, you know, just business model and scale and technology product and, and quality was and is very important. Um, how are or what role do you feel that the ed tech companies working in partnership with Australian it is can uh, help drive the quality uh, in, you know, in, in this space? Well, I mean, I think this is where you know, definitely ed tech can help universities continue to operate and teach and educate despite, you know, another pandemic or, you know, what we've seen through the pandemic closures, you know, it definitely gives universities the tools to deliver quality learning opportunities. Um, but, you know, I think the quality issue is really important. The quality of online learning is an important issue and I think it raises many questions. Universities in Australia and India are clearly concerned about student support how student, supporting students studying online to increase their student engagement is, is one area. That's both, you know, academic support, but also pastoral care support. Um, you know, EdTech is providing new tools to support the student experience, but I think it needs to, we need to address some of that. Also, what needs to be done to address issues sort of associated with online assessment. So, you know, looking at privacy concerns, issues around plagiarism and so on. I think universities, again, are, are already working with ed tech, um, you know, on, on those sorts of solutions. But what also can be done for students facing challenges relating, say, to connectivity to online learning and assessment? Not everyone has internet connectivity, um, quality connectivity. Uh, not everyone can afford to pay for internet connectivity. And there are those days when, you know, the power just cuts off. So um, I think we do need to be aware that there are still these sorts of access issues. Um, nevertheless, it's I think it's great to see that some of the most innovative um, new ed tech solutions are coming out of India, such as Emeritus and um, Simple, Simple e Learn and Upgrad um, as some of those. Um, but look, I think it's, it's overall, it's important to recognise that there might be tensions between, say, the aims and interests of ed tech companies and Australian universities being, you know, different. Ed tech companies obviously focusing more on the commercial space, uh, whereas, you know, the, the education, the universities uh, want to build, say, closer bilateral ties, they want to fo foster cu cultural understanding, they want to advance democracy. I think, though, that, you know, these sorts of considerations for universities in ed, ed tech can, can conflict but can also really work together um, to, to look at sorts of business models that work for both. I can, I'll just add in there, I, I agree with the, the idea that there's um, potential conflict. I just don't think there is. Like, I just don't think that the conflict is as clear cut as that because... Um, Good ed tech leaders, those who build big, big businesses are really focused on the education as well. And I think they're an enabling technology and there's certainly great alignment between them. And you mentioned some fantastic Indian ed tech companies that are doing great things here. And, and I've, I've shared the story a couple of times over the last few months. I, I personally have done a micro-credential from Cambridge University, delivered by Emeritus and experienced that. And one of the things, and I go keep going back to this competitive advantage um, scenario, yeah. and I think about... Australia's competitive advantage is our university, the incredible investment that's been made in, in the market. And if we think about competitive advantage coming the other way, the competitive advantage is 
capacity to deliver, like let, let's not think about it as price point pressure, right? Like it's not, the price point isn't the driving factor. What it is, is the ability to deliver it efficiently, right? Like Indian ed tech companies deliver things in, at efficiency. Their, their technology is world-class. Sometimes we can have a, I don't know what the, the polite way to say it in company is, but sometimes we have this idea that we're going to bring these great ideas to emerging markets. When in fact, actually, there's an incredible opportunity to learn. And uh, um, as Lisa mentioned before, I, I involved in some of these roundtables that we did with the Australia India Institute in Delhi and Bangalore. And I was blown away by some of the technology that I saw, especially at the IIIT in Bangalore around education. The one that will stay with me for a very long time was there were two of them. One was a, a piece of software using artificial intelligence that allowed a, an educator, whether it's a lecturer or a classroom teacher or a vocational teacher, to be able to put some index items saying, hey, I'm going to talk about competitive advantage and strategy development and market development. And then the AI went into the video that were recorded and went and tagged everywhere that the, that, that the lecturer spoke about it so that within the matter of minutes, the lecturer's um, uh, recording could be tagged catalogued, uploaded to an LMS and allow students to go and access it. There's a couple of Australian companies that are starting to think about that now, but that was three or four years ago. The other one, which will stay with me, and it, and it feels very much like an Indian story, to be really honest, which is there was these guys with this fantastic tablet for remote um, uh, online exams. And it was a beautiful piece of technology to use. Not much, so much on the aesthetics and the beauty of how the thing was packaged, and it was pretty raw, and um, it was still needed. Uh, it there was no Johnny Ives Apple uh, user interface being developed just yet, but you could see the underlying technology was really strong. And I'm incredibly, incredibly bullish on the idea that um, let's not let's not think this is a one-way street. There is a huge opportunity to to build these partnerships. And I, I sit in the coal face of trying to um, advise, <coughs> excuse me, and talk to companies as, as Invest Victoria and do and Global Victoria do is trying to think about market entry. And one of, the, one of the things that I see is the best way to do market entry is to go and build connections with your peers who have done it before. And um, the Victorian government supported Edge of Growth and IDA delivering a thing we call the EdTech um, um, uh, Innovation Exchange a couple of years ago now, Michelle, does that sort of feel right? The pandemic's changed my time frame yeah. a little bit. Pre-pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> and building the connections between between tech entrepreneurs as peers and bringing educators in is really important. Yeah, I want to mention a couple of things that David said, actually, because I'm um, equally upbeat about some of the incredible tech we're seeing come out of India. So thanks for bringing up that um, that kit for uh, examinations, David. Having met them through that that workshop, we've continued to work with them and, and they are progressing um, business activities in Australia. But again, I was so impressed by that, that technology, not just for the hardware, but in behind it, um, what they're able to tell you about how exam questions are written. And the wonderful thing about India, and this is a, a product that's already sort of been used and tested in some other IITs, is you know their database is like three hundred thousand examinations that they've delivered. You know they've got numbers that we could never never manage. Then you know Australia very much regards ourselves in leaders in vocational education. How we sort of manage experiential learning is is something we've all got to uh, grapple with as as that becomes an online offering. And I recently saw down at one of um, the startup incubation centres in Chennai just this tech that blew me away about how to assess spray painters. So, and again, it had a whole AI deep tech back end to it as well, but sort of too, too complex for me to understand. But I thought, yeah, these are issues that India is grappling with and managing too. And by nature of this market, they're likely to get the tech, but we might be able to offer the scaffold that goes underneath that. Um, that's the learning system as well. But also just wanting to add on to that that I think the opportunity for um, Australian providers to partner with Indian institutions uh, as well as at tech is to look at where we can innovate into the curriculum um, you know and and what are the areas that we can pick up and and sort of work around that in the need of where the jobs are going to be into the future 
So I think that, for example, if we say use of artificial intelligence, um, you know, we, we've uh, sort of done a program through Deacon Co, a very interesting model with the Tata Group, which talks about artificial intelligence for decision makers and completely dri driven and delivered on the Tata EdTech platform. And this can be used by people all over the world in the Tata Group, as well as outside for upskilling in that specific area. So I think that it is, it's a question of the technology is great in India, absolutely. The curriculum is, is brilliant as well. But to bring in an element, say, from an Australian institution, whether it's a higher ed or it's a, it's a vocational institution, to be able to marry that and to be able to deliver something, which I think somebody made a point before, that adds value overall to the graph, career graph or the knowledge graph, I think um, is where the opportunity for Australian providers is definitely in India. I'm glad you raised that, Ravneet. I was actually going to ask you the uh, role of global system integrators in bringing the two together as well, because the technology hubs and the innovation around piloting that you mentioned earlier, David, you know, th these things are, I believe that there are, there's a, there's a, an interest in and a keen um, want to try and see how a concept can be actually integrated and GSIs do play a role. And I'm just wondering if, um, if we, if we're seeing that and uh, if that can also be part of that, you know, overall end-to-end uh, -end contribution to, to the growth of the education market. And Ravneet, I think you, you, you pointed to that in, in Tata. I'm, I'm just not sure if, you know, that is something that the, the state government and, and other institutions are, are looking to um, in, in partnerships. Um, apart from that, I wanted to ask you, Michelle, the, the research that you spoke about earlier, is that something that is uh, easily attainable? Um, how, how do... Um, businesses with ideas uh, access that research to then be able to set the vision, um, help prioritise and then uh, work to pilot, as David mentioned earlier, uh, into different markets. Yes, yeah, so that was written up as a short uh, policy paper by AII, so I think it'll be on Australia India Institute's um, website. But I think too, you know, then with, with all of this work that we're doing uh, and with the connections that we've built over these uh, last three years and the way the industry's grown, it's certainly going to be a time that uh, we start talking to to Lisa and, and David in particular, as, as well as the providers like Deacon, about doing a refresh of that paper. Where are we now? Can I add in there as well is that also there are some models that we've been piloting uh, to show these connections and a, a great example of it is also in partnership with Global Victoria called the EdTech Innovation Alliance, where basically in, in really simple terms, we have connected nine Victorian EdTech companies with um, a range of Victorian education providers and international education providers, of which I think off the top of my head, there's actually one that's based in India, but I, I would have to go and have a look. I vaguely recall there being someone in um, Bangalore or Mumbai. And they've had the support of a researcher uh, looking at what the impact of their product is on, on the market. So there are models that we are building in partnership with government and education providers. And in fact, the research on that project is being completed by two amazing um, Victorian universities, Deakins, one of them, and Monash University, the other. So that that's wrapping up soon, and we're actually going to be publishing the results of those. But it's had a really positive impact on, <coughs> excuse me, learners in the project, but also the pro progress of those companies and a whole bunch of research that will fall out the back end of it that will be require further investigation. But uh, there, there's, there are models that are um, emerging of how you do this in a structured and a accelerated way, as opposed to traditional research, which may, um, to the academics on the call and on the panel who may be um, scared by my summit, the, the three to five year research project, we're doing three to six month research projects so that we can get some action research into market. Ben, can I just say on Michelle's point, I think that's a really good idea to look at doing an update from that piece of research that we did here at the Institute on, it was a very short policy brief we did on um, fostering linkages um, and partnerships between um, opportunities between ed tech uh, in Victoria and India. So, yeah, I think with, with all the changes that have occurred, particularly pandemic, post-pandemic, there's definitely scope to, to revisit some research in that space. And if anyone would like um, 
um, access to that report, we can we can share the link. That's brilliant. Um, an action has come out of this round table. That's fantastic. Um, I I think just conscious of uh, you know the, the point in, in the in the round table, it might be a good opportunity to invite Shibani in, who has been uh, collecting some of the questions, both uh, pre round table as well as during uh, today's conversation, and maybe you know field a few questions, and then um, at the end of that, we might uh, come by and do final statements. But uh, Shibani, over to you. Thank you so much, Ben, and thank you so much to the panel. What a fabulous conversation going on. Uh, so, Ben, uh, we collected a couple of questions prior to this session. Uh, let me start with the first one. Uh, so, the person says, student engagement has been a challenge. Are there any new techniques adopted to engage and develop learning habits? That, that, that's a great question. Probably, uh, David, you, you, you're smiling. Do you want to have a first crack at it? I just, I, yeah, I'll have, I'll happily add something because I've been saying it a couple of times. So I feel like I, it was a question I pre-wrote maybe. Um, <laughs> I think that it's really important over to, to think about the last couple of years where we've had really disrupted education and there are horrifying statistics around the world. And Paul Ronalds from Save the Children talked about 1.6 billion children who, have, who lost access to education of which 600 million will never return to a classroom because of the economic situation within the country they're in. But I, I, I say to those who are in a position to be able to review what's happened in the last couple of years, and Australia is very lucky to be able to be in that situation, and so is places like India, but let's not use the emergency response of the pandemic as the gold standard for which we should try and meet for education online going forward. It was an emergency response, and, and I've been making the point that we should use it as a foundation from which to build. It's allowed us to build this social license at big mass scale and rapid scale to say, online learning is valid. It's an appropriate way to learn. And now we're saying, okay, so now how do we change it and drive that forward? So there are definitely great technologies coming about that are being able to connect students and educators in real time with the support that they need. If you just think back, go back even pre-pandemic, forget that we had a pandemic, go back three years. Would you have thought that a Victorian university had a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week online service that could answer a student's question about what they need for their course, what they need for their mental health, whatever? And those services exist at scale, right? And they, they have grown really quickly. So I think that there are models appearing all the time and they will evolve and we will start to hit these gold standards that we're hoping. And and I think that, um, Ben, there is, uh, from, a, from an institution perspective, there is definitely the need and intent from institutions to buy into these technologies, develop these technologies that are going to enhance the engagement with students. So it is not just about having digital content and then delivering that. It is about real engagement. So institutions are very, very keen to make sure that they are engaging with their um, uh, students and that there is a continuous process of improvement. As David says, there is definitely technology available, but new technology is being developed every day as we speak. That's brilliant. Thank you, Shibani. Okay, uh, the next question is, uh, any advice for parents as they try to educate their child in this digital world? I think from my perspective, it will be that um, be uh, open and engaged, uh, you know, to new technologies, new ways of learning. I mean, of course, you know, there will be a hybrid model that will eventually come out to be the main uh, game changer. Uh, but be open to the idea and accept the idea that's not going to be the traditional way as we have all been used to in the past. And, and I think support from parents is really important. I think I was going to say on this one, uh, I mentioned it before, be discerning in what you choose, you know, look look for quality and look for outcomes. But in line with what Ravneet had to say, uh, be open and be thinking about how learning and learning habits uh, might change with new technologies as well. And not every experience, like even in the classroom, is going to be exactly as you expect it. So to allow the evolution and to allow for the development, but to reach out and talk to the community if there are things that need adjusting or are, you know, seemingly un 
just don't fit because the whole cyber security component as well is a big component uh, comes back to the technology and the quality that we spoke about but also you know some of the policies that are in place so yeah, it's, a, it's a tough one and as a parent um you know i'm, I'm evolving with with my kids and uh, you know their attitude is probably even better than ours because um they're willing to to take it on and they don't get locked into one way of, of doing something but how you know we do have a curriculum and we do need to ensure that there is standards and uh, that that needs to evolve through the platform. That's another great question, Shivani. Thank you. Was there another one? There is another one, and I'm sorry I've forgotten the names of sent them. There were so many that came in. Um, so the third one says, what are some of the ways to collaborate for student faculty exchange trips, joint projects, etc.? Um, for student faculty exchange, I, I'm happy for universities to reach out to, to our office. It's something that we frequently uh, are able to talk to them about the sort of information that they need to be able to provide in order to be in contact with you know, uh, Australia's largest education ecosystem, which is in Victoria. So um, please put that in as part of our follow up as well. Can I, can uh, yeah, I also add in there as well? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, at the Institute, the Australian India Institute, we, we don't belong to any one faculty. We, we, are, we are part of the University of Melbourne. We're located at the University of Melbourne, but we, you know, uh, tap in and engage with all faculties. So we'd be more than happy to, to play that sort of conduit role. I think from my... Uh, oh, oh, sorry, I'll I was... Just... Needs, sorry. sorry. Sorry, you go, dude. Okay. No, no, go. Um, I think uh, also, uh, you know, we tried um, virtual internships um, and uh, during and they worked beautifully. In fact, we've got feedback from both the place where the internships took place and from the students to say they want they want to do this again and they want to do it at scale. So I think that while the idea of student mobility in physical form or um, engagement is extremely important, but to be able to have that at scale, one could even explore the virtual um, internships or the virtual mobility options, which have, have really appeared to be quite successful during the pandemic. David? But that was the point I was going to make. There, there, there are platforms and structured programs in your you're seeing um, some programs that it's really experiential learning, right? Like experiential learning is becoming such an important part of it that it's able to create those connections also to industry as well. Brilliant. Okay. Um, I think I will drop off, uh, but then before I do go, there were some of you who asked uh, to be connected with the panelists. So I think they're all available on LinkedIn. So, you know, we'll, we'll forward the LinkedIn contact and please do reach out to them. Uh, someone asked about the recording, so that will be shared as well. So That's right. over to you, Ben. No, look, and I think it's just uh, if we can go around for, for final statements, um, you know, specifically areas of... Um, your 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 interest and uh and i think we'll, we'll close out uh, and david maybe you can go last so you can talk about the exciting month of august okay michelle maybe we start with you well i was going to say ben you know of anyone leap squared's a great example of the sorts of collaboration that we like to have with with companies and what we're seeing you know it's a great example of the leading indian company working and, and growing and supporting the industry so i just wanted to say uh, thank you for that. We look forward to your, your continued growth. Uh, also, I hope everyone's got out of today the incredible energy and the incredible synergy between this part of the world. Now, we've spoken a lot about India, but also keep in mind the other areas of South Asia that my office looks after, and particularly, I would say, Bangladesh and uh, Sri Lanka also. So thank you. Thank you. Ravneet? Well, I just say that uh, there is huge opportunity, definitely, uh, you know, in the tech space. Um, and uh, I would encourage institutions um, listening here and companies in this space to think about India, but also think about how together we can we can look at exploring a collaboration with the rest of the world as well to take forward a product or take forward a service that can be provided to uh, people all over the world, especially in the Asia, Asia Pacific. But, you know, the question to me, and, and I think the answer is as well, it is not whether one should do it or not. One will have to do it, right? Because this is going to be the future where you will have to invest in hybrid models of education, 
teaching and learning, lifelong learning. You know, you need it when you need it. And also um, the stackables. So the question for institutions is when when is the right time? And now is the right time. Should have been a long time back, but now is the right time to think about how you can partner with companies, with um, providers in India to start looking at the India market, but also to look at other parts of the world. So, and I think an integration of digital learning across the segments, institutions, um, employers, using big data, predictive data, and, and, and also looking at the challenges across quality drop-offs is going to be the new game that institutions and stakeholders will have to consider. Thank you, Rafnik. Lisa. Then I might take this opportunity to, you know, in the interest of continuing the conversation, uh, to share that the Institute is, is hosting an Australia-India Leadership Dialogue in, in early September in New Delhi. Uh, we've partnered with Australian-founded tech company Atlassian to, to deliver this dialogue with us, as well as other supporting partners such as Tata Consulting Services, um, and look, the focus clearly is on emerging technology. Uh, and in one of the sessions, we will very much focus on skills mobility, on recruitment, uh, you know, issues of, of talent and skills growth that we need in, in the tech sector in India and Australia and how we can, you know, looking at sort of skills rec recognition and quality um, degree recognition as well, which has been part of the Australian government's focus how we can ensure that this sort of tech sector growth uh, can be delivered in terms of the graduates that come come through the systems. So lots of scope there will be co-moderated by um, Arvani Brapaka, who is the, the, the Vice President of Atlassian, and also our um, Deputy Vice Chancellor International, Michael Wesley, here at University of Melbourne. But there'll be a lot of conversations that come out of that. There's five Australian universities that will be attending uh, as well as uh, four IITs in, in India and three universities in India. So there's quite a strong ed tech focus and we're, we'd be happy at the Institute to share our findings that come out of that day. Brilliant. Thank you, Lisa. David. Thanks very much, everyone. It's been a real pleasure to, to hear from everyone. I, I guess my, my closing comment here is something I've mentioned a couple of times already, which is, the opportunity is big. It's it's just getting started. The the connections between Australia and India across education go on for decades, and it's now going to evolve, and it is evolving into a technical enabled solutions around that. So I'm incredibly excited by that. As you alluded to as well, Ben, we do have a really big program happening, and. I'm going to say Melbourne becomes the centre of the EdTech ecosystem across um, Asia Pacific for the month of August. There's so many events going on. We have beginning on the 8th of August, um, we have Melbourne EdTech Week. So we've got the Melbourne EdTech Summit on Monday and Tuesday, which you can attend if you're in Melbourne face to face, or if not, you can do it hybridly as well. You can join virtually and you can listen to 100 people over a couple of days talk about what the future of education innovation looks like and technology enabling it. We then moved to EduTech, which is the largest EdTech trade show in uh, the Southern Hemisphere. It happens in Melbourne at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. And then it continues on where you've got the Times Higher Education Live happens in Melbourne on the Monday, Tuesday and the Wednesday after that as well. So it, it's, uh, there's a lot of education happening in um, uh, Melbourne over the month of August and technology is at the centre of all of those conversations. I'll just drop a link to uh, Melbourne EdTech if anybody wanted to come along. Fantastic. Well, what I took away really is, is you're right, we've needed the energy. There's energy, there's intent, <coughs> there's uh, support. And, uh, you know, I think um, I, I'm hoping that uh, the group and the audience took away that as well um, and got some nuggets themselves. Um, to the four of you, thank you very, very much uh, for your warmth, for your insights, for your support today. and and hopefully into the future. Um, we are Lead Squared, and uh, you can come and catch us uh, down uh, Deakin downtown as well and, uh, and, and, and other aspects of uh, EdTech during, uh, during that week. I want to thank everyone again, um, Shibani and the back of house as well, and uh, wish everyone uh, a great uh, end of week and see you soon. That's all for us. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks, Beth.